Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls, and it is my great joy to love, support, and encourage you as you move about your life's path. I facilitate one-on-one angel sessions, I offer soul mentoring and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into a lovely, sweet, soothing space for rest and relaxation. As most of you know, I have been listening to sleep podcasts for years, and I find that they are so helpful in building that bridge between my waking consciousness and that beautiful mystery of sleep. And I love them so much that I was guided to create this program for you because I believe there can't be enough sleep podcasts out there. I'm always looking for new ones, so my hope is this will find its way to you, and you will be able to come into a lovely space of light and sweetness. I know some of you listen to help you fall asleep, and others of you listen during your waking hours. And however you choose to listen to this podcast, you have my blessing and gratitude. I am so deeply grateful for this opportunity to be here with you. So the way the program works, we will be together for about an hour, usually the first 15 to 20 minutes. I share with you something about the angels or something on our spiritual path, and I bring the angels in. And so not only do I speak to you about the angels, but my intention is for this broadcast to be filled with the love of the angels so you can receive light from the angelic realms as you're listening. And then... For the second part of the program, I share with you some kind of story. I share with you perhaps a story from my life. I'll read to you from something in the public domain. I'll flip through the pages of an old cookbook or TV guide or catalog, and we'll go down memory lane together. So there's a variety of episodes. This is my 120th episode. So there are lots of episodes you can listen to. What I do with sleep podcasts is I set the timer on the app to stop playing after the first episode is done. But some people like to set up a playlist that can run for hours So whatever you decide to do will be perfect. And my hope is you will feel into the love we are bringing forward for you here and now. And I'm guided to share with you about the beauty and the goodness that comes with the exercise and consciousness that we call hope. Hope is such a powerful expression 
of feeling into the future streams and visualizing and energizing what might be. You know, we all have this secret garden of consciousness where only we dwell. And we share such a small percentage of that consciousness with others. If you think about the parts of your beingness that you share and how much of your beingness is secret and sacred and private. So we get to choose how we hold for things in consciousness. I come from a long line of worriers. <laughs> I'm a worrier. I wish I wasn't, but I am. And it actually happens that I have a genetic mutation that causes me to be prone to worrying. I learned about this when I first did the ancestry tests. And just so you know, this mutation is not rare. 25% of the population has it. And what happens is it causes the dopamine to build up in the prefrontal cortex, that there's an enzyme that is supposed to dissipate the dopamine, and in 25% of us, it doesn't work effectively. And so there's a buildup of dopamine, which can cause worrying, panic, anxiety. <laughs> Sound familiar? And so... By nature, I'm a warrior, but also by nature, I am hopeful and optimistic. So I thought perhaps, rather than talking about worry, we could talk about hope. And you have probably heard this quote before, but it's so beautiful, I'm going to share it with you now. It's Hope is the Thing with Feathers by Emily Dickinson. And it says, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. And the sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could have bashed the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chilliest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Isn't that beautiful? Hope is the thing with feathers. So I thought, as I call the angels in here, for us in this episode, we could ask them to help us focus on the beautiful vibration of hopefulness. That whatever is transpiring in your life that has you worried, that I want to affirm for you that the light is streaming in and goodness is flowing to you. So I'm going to invite you to take some nice deep breaths in and out. And the angels are bringing to you a beautiful golden light filled with love from God. And I'm going to call the angels in to be with us now so you get comfortable and cozy and snuggle on in while I bring the angels forward. So beautiful angels on high, I ask that you join us here. I ask that you bring forward light and love and healing in service to each of our beloved's highest and best goods. Angels, I ask that you bring forward a lightness of spirit, that you help each one of us find altitude so that we can gracefully find our way forward. 
and angels, I ask that you bring forward an infusion of hope, of optimism, helping each one of us come into alignment with our brighter tomorrows. So dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in, allowing the angels to fill the space that you are in with a soft pink light. With your permission, they will help to clear away anything that is worrying you, anything that feels like a burden or a hardship. They will help to clear the heaviness from you so that it is easier for you to connect with your divine self. Then we will ask them to sprinkle blessings on your path. You know, I think I have perhaps shared this story with you before, but I'll share it with you again. So... Back in 2013, my husband and I had one of those perfectly awful years. I won't go into everything that was happening, but it was one of those years where the storms of life kept knocking on our door. And my husband tends to be pretty resilient with these things, but I feel everything deeply. Referencing back to that worry gene, I get overloaded and flooded emotionally sometimes. So 2013 was definitely one of those years for me. And part of what the stress was is we were in a financial situation with a second home that my husband owned up in Washington in this little town in central Washington near the Columbia River. And it had all my money stuff up. Like this was going to be a disaster. We weren't going to be able to write the ship. Like all of my fears were up. And one day I felt the angels come in. And they said, you're going to want to be really mindful about how you tell the story because you're going to get to be right. And here is what we recommend that you start saying instead of what you have been already telling yourself and others. They suggested I start telling the story in this way. You know what? All of my stuff is up. This has been a really hard year and I'm not sure how I'm going to find or how we're going to find our way out of it. And then the angels showed me the pivot point and that was this one. But here is what I know. I know that God always takes care of me. And as they brought that piece of wisdom forward, they started showing me all the times that grace showed up in my life. So, here is what I know. That God always takes care of me. And things always have a way of working out for me. And I could feel into the truth of that. I I happen to live a very blessed life and Always things seem to work out. Things seem to turn. I seem to find my way. So they had me start telling the story that way. So this has been a really difficult year and all my stuff is up. But here is what I know. God always takes care of me and things always seem to work out. So I affirm that right now things are transpiring in a way that will feel so much better and brighter than it does right now. And so I really shifted and I started holding it in consciousness this way. And I really appreciated that guidance because it made space for my upset and fear. I wasn't doing a spiritual bypass on it. 
but it also allowed me to pivot and remember all the times that life worked out for me. And that in some way is that vibration of hope that we're speaking about. And here's what happened. Probably about five months later, I met these two beautiful women who were married to each other. And we had talked about some potential projects over the phone. And then one of them signed up for a class with me. And in that particular class, I had everyone share where they lived. And it turned out that these women lived in the town adjacent to this house that we owned. (laughs) And they loved where they lived. And I had had such bad associations because of everything we had been through. They said, next time you come up, we want to help you fall in love with this place. And they did. They showed up, just like this beam of light showed up. And they showed me the area where our house was through their eyes. It was a place that they loved. They became friends of ours. (laughs) And things worked out. I mean, listen, it was still a long and hard journey for us with this home. And and I'm not going to go into all the details, but it wasn't easy. But this prayer, this affirmation, this hope, this promise became powerful within me. That I could acknowledge that things were challenging, and yet the promise, the hope, the sweetness the awareness that I happen to live a blessed life and life works out for me was there to help soothe and comfort me during the challenging parts. So I thought I would share with you some of the things that are making me so hopeful right now. And they're not things specific to me. They're things that are happening in the collective. Because listen, I know that we can certainly look into the collective and see all of the things that aren't working well, (laughs) right? Life is kind of challenging these days, but there are wonderful things that are bringing me a tremendous amount of hope. So one is something I started sharing with you last month about which is ChatGPT and all of the things that are happening with AI. Our life is going to change dramatically in the next 10 years because of AI. And many, many things are going to be more available to the masses and are going to be made easier for us all. And so I am so excited about the developments that are coming down the pike. Even already, it's helping me with my copywriting, with keeping my thoughts organized. You know, I'm 60 years old now. My, um, my executive, what do they call it? Your executive function when they say that, you know, you get brain fog and you're not as good as organizing things, whatever that is. It's not horrible for me these days, but I don't necessarily have the razzle-dazzle I once did for keeping myself organized and writing out my thoughts and copywriting and all of that. And ChatGPT is like my friend now. I'm like, hey, can we write some stuff together? And I give it my thoughts and it cleans it up. So I am so excited and hopeful about what AI is going to be bringing forward for us all. Another thing that I am profoundly hopeful about, it feels like it is the answer to a lifelong prayer. And that is the obesity medications that are coming on the market, like Wegovy and Manjaro. You know, I have lived 
55 years of my life battling weight. And I spent many decades of my life feeling like it was all my fault. It was a personal failing, that there was something wrong with me, that I could not handle this on my own. And somewhere around 2013, I started finding information that said that might not be true. This may be a metabolic condition. And that means that that's not about my personal failing. It means there's something going on with me physically. And over the years, I have learned so much more about this that I really, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Let me say it differently. Where for the first 40 years of my life, I thought my weight was 100% my fault. I now believe that my weight might be only 25% my fault. (laughs) And it might not be any of my fault, but there has been a profound shift in the way the medical community is contemplating obesity. There was one woman who had posted something on Twitter. I wish I had saved it, but I didn't. She had spent her career researching obesity based on the premise of it being an, you know, energy in, energy out imbalance, right? So you're eating too much and not moving enough. And in this tweet, she said, I am now reconciling that I have spent my career chasing the wrong premise when it comes to obesity. Isn't that profound? And I have been praying for this because for the last easily seven years of my life, I have absolutely believed that this is a physical metabolic imbalance. That just like my body knows how to set my temperature And my blood pressure, it regulates these things. It regulates weight. And these new drugs that are coming on the market are indicating that there is an intervention available that helps with weight loss. Now, it's in the very early days. You know, the research is still early. And I think all of the people who are trying these medications are very courageous and they're going to be providing data that will help the collective in years to come. So I am so hopeful that in the next five to 10 years that our understanding and the way we treat obesity will profoundly change for the better. which I think is so cool, and I am so looking forward to that time. (laughs) So these are just two examples of things that give me so much hope for the future. That I know that the world is a bit crazy right now, and there's plenty of things to feel worried about. But also the best and the brightest among us They are working on solutions. They are working on new developments. They are trying to see things through new eyes and build new approaches to old problems. So this is my invitation to you to allow the angels to connect you with hope of seeing the world through brighter eyes and brighter tomorrows. Whether it is your personal material in your life, or whether it is challenges taking place in the collective. Let's take a deep breath in together and breathe in the beautiful invitation of hope. Of affirming that brighter tomorrows are on their way to us now. 
that the angels are sprinkling blessings onto your personal path and onto the path of those you love and into the collective. That this world is a big, beautiful place and goodness is happening in your name. So take a nice deep breath in and release. So in this moment, there is such beautiful energy flowing through for us all. And my hope is you can feel it. There is such love here for you. So just allow yourself to relax. Allowing the angels to bring the love to you. And you can drift off if you are feeling sleepy. And while you do, your angels will be with you. And I'm going to tell you a story. So one of the things that is so enchanting to me about creating this podcast is I wonder sometimes if I'm going to run out of things to talk about. And then, sometime last night, this new idea came forward of something I could share with you. It's something from my life that I haven't thought about in years. And all of a sudden, it showed up. And what excites me about it is this perception that I might run out of things to talk about, that I don't have to worry about it. Because somewhere in my data bank of consciousness is 60 years worth of experiences <laughs> and reflections that the angels are going to help me retrieve. And so this is the memory that the angels helped bring into my present day consciousness to share with you. And it has to do with a time back in the late 80s when I was a contestant on a game show. <laughs> I don't know why this makes me laugh. Because, listen, how many of you have ever been on a game show? It's not the kind of experience that most people get to have. And so, I thought it would be fun to share with you some of what I learned from that experience about, at least for the game show that I was on, how I decided to apply for it, what the experience was like when I was actually on it. And so it'll be an interesting story, especially if you don't know anything about the workings of game shows. So many moons ago, when I first moved to Los Angeles and I was working for the Samuel Goldwyn Company, it just so happened that there were a couple of guys who worked there who were around my age who were all from Chicago. I mean, the HR department could not have done this better, that there was a little group of us that were all from Chicago. We didn't know each other when we lived in Chicago, but Chicago people love other Chicago people, and so we became really good friends, all of us. And one of our friends, Mark, before I met him, had been on the game show Sale of the Century. And he had won $25,000, and he'd won a car and a lot of prizes that included a lot of couches, which I remember because... His house was like a jigsaw puzzle of couches, which was awesome for being in our 20s because, you know, we traveled in big groups and we would all go over there and watch the football and baseball games. So Mark had won a lot of money on this game show. And so at some point, my other friend and I thought, well, let's apply. If Mark could do it, maybe we can too. I mean, I didn't know that I was going to win $25,000, but it seemed like a really fun adventure. So here's the thing, at least about that game show, which I think is going to be 
pretty similar to other game shows. Once a month or so, they had a group casting where you could just go and apply. And it was two parts. One was a trivia test of some kind and not the cool trivia. Like what was the actress's name who played Marsha Brady? Like I would do really good on that kind of trivia, but it was more things like mythology, history, science, you know, there might've been some science And the truth be told, I would have not passed this test on my own, but my friend who I was with, he was really, really smart. And I cheated off of his test with his permission. So because of him, I passed the first round of testing. You had to get a certain score in order to move on to the second part of the casting call. So I passed through to the second part because I cheated off of my friend. There, I have now admitted it. So, the second part was you had to get up and give like a 30 second introduction about yourself. And they wanted to know where you were from and something interesting about yourself. Because if you ever watch game shows, you know how they go to each contestant. And they say, and here is Mary from Duluth. And Mary has a collection of over a thousand salt and pepper shakers, right? There's like something interesting and unique that each of the contestants brings forward. Well, for sale of the century, they did that as part of our audition process. So I don't recall that we got to see each other's auditions, but My friend, who I had cheated off of, he was very dry in his sense of humor. And I don't remember what he said, but he didn't make it through to the next round because of however he, you know, shared about himself. I don't remember what happened. But when it was my turn, you know, I'm a pretty bright and shiny, razzle-dazzle kind of girl. Like, I've got this red fluffy hair, and I'm pretty exuberant when I want to be. And I don't remember all of what I said, but I remember my spark line, the thing that was like, this is, this is my glitter. This is my extra something. So I, the beginning was probably something like, hi, I'm Laurel Bleeden Maffei, and I am from Chicago, Illinois, and I moved out to Los Angeles to work in the entertainment industry. And so far, My claim to fame is that I rode in an elevator with Mikhail Baryshnikov. (laughs) And, And I'm sure I said it in a way that was bright and shiny with a lot of personality. And so at the end of the day, they called me back to be a contestant and my friend did not get called back, which was really not fair because he was the one that had the intellectual prowess for this game. Whereas I was just really good at reading off his answers and then being all kind of bright and shiny (laughs) in terms of personality. And just as an aside, I had, I did not ride in an elevator with Mikhail Baryshnikov, but I loved Mikhail Baryshnikov so much And he once came to the Samuel Goldwyn office for a meeting. They were considering remaking a bishop's wife. And they thought that he might be a good choice to play Dudley the Angel. This is a little inside entertainment industry stuff that I'm sure nobody but me remembers. And I was just a flutter that he was going to be in our office And so I asked the receptionist who I was friends with, listen, when he gets in the elevator, call my phone, ring once and hang up. And then I'll go to the elevator and pretend that I'm getting on. (laughs) And so she did. And so when he got into the elevator to leave the office, she called my phone and hung up. And then I ran over to the elevator because I was on a different floor, and 
Sure enough, the elevator doors opened, Mikhail Barishnikov walked out, and I walked in. So I passed him in an elevator, but I changed the story so I could get on to sale of the century. <laughs> so, so now I'm a contestant and they give you your taping days. They ask that you block off a series of days. I want to say it was three to five days. I don't really remember. Now, here's the thing you should know. I don't know if you've ever heard of the quiz show scandals back in the 50s, but because of the scandals, there are all of these laws, rules, regulations in place to make sure that game shows are not rigged. And here's some of the things that took place. So the first thing is they give you your days of taping and you are not guaranteed to be on the show. They recruit more contestants than they need so that the producers and the people who actually manage the game show cannot assign contestants to different games. It has to be random. So they recruit and they bring in more people than they will need. We bring in five changes of clothes because they tape multiple shows in a day. So let's say I was in the first game of the day and I win and I'm going to be carried over to the next day. I would then go change it into a different outfit and then they would tape the second show, which would be then shown a different day. So we had to bring in multiple changes of clothing. They were asking us not to wear white, don't wear black, don't wear loud patterns. So I remember I wore, I had this blue sweater with the shoulder pads, of course, because it was the 80s, and a skirt underneath it. And I think I had my magenta suede boots that I loved. That was my first outfit. And you're not allowed to talk to anyone who works for the show. They had a contestant coordinator who was the only one that was allowed to speak with us. So we were kept in a separate room and they said, no one from the show is allowed to speak to you. So if you see any of the engineers or the actors or the producers and they walk past you and don't acknowledge you, they are not being rude. They are not allowed to. So we were isolated from everyone having to do anything with the show, again, to maintain the integrity of the game show. They also write multiple questions for the shows, and no one knows what questions are going to be asked. So if, let's say, they were going to be asking 10 questions in the first segment, they would write 50 questions, and they would be randomly picked. So there were all of these ways of protecting the integrity of the show. And then there was a lottery system to see which ones of us would be asked to play the game. So I think I sat through two tapings where I hadn't been chosen. And you know what was so interesting is one of the questions that was asked, I seem to recall this was a trivia game, so I was not a contestant at this point. But the question had to do with Samuel Goldwyn Sr. They had said he was a glove maker and they had given his original name. And I must have gasped because one of the actresses who was, you know, the one who revealed the prizes kind of looked up at me and I thought, oops, I think I gave something away there. But that wasn't a question when I was playing. But I think in the third round or something like that, I got selected to play. So, so now here's my opportunity, right? My friend Mark had, um, had won $25,000 in a car. Like, okay, maybe I'm going to get some goods here. And I don't remember much about the taping. I seem to recall I, there were three of us and I was in the far right seat. 
that's as much as I remember. And a lot of these games, it has to do with the timing of the buzzer, right? So they ask the question and you buzz in. And so if somebody else is better timed on the buzzer, they get to answer the questions. So I don't really remember if I got questions right or wrong. Like I don't have any drama or trauma associated with that other than to say, I didn't win. (laughs) So, wah, wah, I did not win the game. But I got the consolation prizes, right? Like, you know how they say, and contestants will receive, well, I received Echo Bakeware and a year's supply of some kind of sugar substitute, whatever the sugar substitute was at the time. If that isn't a weird metaphor for my life, um, hi, we're going to give you food related stuff. So here's some Echo Bakeware and here's a year supply of whatever it was, sweet and low or whatever, whatever the substitute sugar was. And, um, and that's what I got. And so, so after my episode, then I get whisked away. So, so you, you immediately get whisked away as soon as you're done. And there was paperwork we needed to sign because you have to pay taxes on your prizes. Did you know that? So when you see these people on game shows that are getting cars and vacations and barbecue pits and things like that, they report all of that to the IRS and you have to pay taxes on it. So I had to sign something. I think my departing prizes were valued at $200 or something like that. And, um, and I, it's not as if they handed them to me and I took them home. They got mailed to me. So I did get some lovely Echo Bakeware. I don't know whatever happened to it. It must have just at some point, um, lost its way in the many moves of my life. And, um, And I just remember this huge box of artificial sweetener. (laughs) I don't even remember what brand it was. And then at some point it aired. But that was my experience on a game show. And what was so fascinating that I hadn't realized was how careful they are to avoid any opportunity for the process to be corrupted. There also were some rules, and I don't know if these are still in place. I seem to recall that the three main networks, so ABC, NBC, and CBS here in the U.S., there there were regulations that all of them agreed to. And it was something like you couldn't be on a game show more than one time a year or one time every three years, it, it was a limited number of opportunities and that you couldn't be on more than three game shows in your life. So, you know, this was going to be one of my opportunities. And then exceptions are made, you know, if it's a returning champion kind of thing. So, you know, when you see people coming back on Jeopardy, that's a different regulation but they really go to great lengths to make sure of the integrity of the process. So it was a really cool experience. I remember going to the studio and, you know, the handlers would talk to us through each step and we could only talk to each other, but then not really, right? We weren't supposed to make friends with the other contestants you know, so we could have very general conversations, but it was not necessarily an opportunity to become social with each other. I seem to recall they fed us lunch because there was a lunch break involved. And this was really before cell phones, so there wasn't a no cell phone rule because we didn't have them back then. And I can't remember if we were able to talk about our experiences before the show aired. I seem to recall that we weren't allowed to do that. 
And then my episode aired and I recorded it on a VHS tape that is now in a landfill somewhere. I'm sorry to say, but people did call me and say, I saw you on television. (laughs) So that was my experience being on a game show. Isn't that fascinating? And I never was on another one. I did, though, often drive past the CBS studios, on, which is on Fairfax, and I would drive past it going to work, and I would always see people lined up waiting to get into the uh, the Price is Right. I always get the Price is Right and Let's Make a Deal confused. I don't really watch game shows, but I know that Let's Make a Deal people wear costumes, So it's the one without the costumes. And I would see people lined up for a block waiting to get in. So if you're ever in Los Angeles and you want to try being on a game show, it's a really cool experience. I mean, it's a kind of experience not a lot of people get to have. And I will also say that in addition to being on the game show, because I've been so enchanted with the entertainment industry and the TV industry for sure. I also got to be in the audience for some tapings of TV shows, which was super cool. So in a previous episode, I shared with you that my cousin Joe Bleeden used to work for Johnny Carson. So I used to get to go to tapings of The Tonight Show. And I didn't go all the time. I wasn't going to take advantage of it. But I think I probably went four or five times. Again, I don't have any specific memories of going to a taping other than on TV, the stage and the curtain seem so big. But when you're there in person, it's It's not as big as it looks. It's actually kind of small, but it's all about camera angles and stuff like that. So I went to tapings of The Tonight Show, and then I had a friend, um, two friends, they were married, and they were both actors, and the husband had a guest role on The Nanny with Fran Drescher. And so his wife and I got to go to a taping of The Nanny when he was on the show. And that was fun. And if you've never been to the taping of a TV show, which I'm sure most of you haven't, it's really cool. So you go into the, they, 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 you know, file you into the audience And then usually there is a comedian who does a warm up because they don't want you to be in the audience and not laugh, right? This is a sitcom. They need the laughter and it, it helps the actors. And so there is usually a comedian who does a warm up to get the group going. And then they give you the rules like about laughter and clapping and Again, I don't think I had a cell phone then, but turn off your cell phone, like whatever, whatever those rules are. And, um, and so they get the audience really amped up and they're like, laugh a lot, have a good time. And then at some point there is a break in the taping and they bring out snacks. (laughs) So again, snacks are important to me in life. And I remember for the nanny, they brought out some kind of like hostess snacks, like ding-dongs and cupcakes. But at that point, I was not eating sugar. And so I did not consume any of the nanny snacks while I was there. And it was cool. And then another taping that I went to was my cousin Kathy who I know listens to the podcast. So Kathy came out to visit me. She was still living in Chicago with her parents and she came out to LA to visit me. And her favorite show at the time was Boy Meets World. Is that what it was? Boy Meets World, right? And I got us tickets to go to the taping. And so again, we went and it was so much fun because I got to bring her and it meant a lot to her. And again, there was a comedian who did the warm up for the show. 
and there was some kind of snack involved. And it's really fun because you get to see how the actors interact with each other when they're out of character. You get to see, you know, how how the directors give notes and things like that. And then I also remember I went to a taping of the Gary Shandling show because we had a friend. This was maybe when I was still working at Goldwyn, if not after, right after that. We had a friend who worked for the producer. And so we got to go to a taping of the Gary Shandling show. Again, I don't have any specific memories about that, but as someone who grew up loving television, I absolutely love that I got to live a time of life when I got to participate in it, whether I was a contestant on a game show (laughs) or I got to go to a taping of a sitcom or the late night show. It was so cool. I got to have a lot of cool experiences in my early days in the entertainment industry, and they were profoundly meaningful to me at the time. I mean, these days, if I got invited to the taping of a show, I don't know that I would be very excited about it. I might think it's cool, but I don't know that I would go out of my way to participate in it. But back then, it meant everything to me. And it was so much fun. But the the memory that really was with me that started this whole thread was the memory of being on sale of the century back in the late 80s and getting my Echo Bakeware. (laughs) And the Samuel Goldwyn question that was asked in one of the games before I was the contestant and how careful they were to maintain the integrity of the game show. It was fascinating. It was really a, an amazing experience. So those are some of my little snippets from my time in Los Angeles, where I got to dip my toe into the TV industry. <laughs> And there's more experiences I will share with you. This is not the totality of my life in LA. I have many other experiences to share with you, but this will be for another day. So that's a little bit about what it's like to be a contestant on a game show or to go to the taping of a sitcom or a late night show. It's super cool. And so if you ever are going to spend time in Los Angeles and want to have that experience, I highly recommend it. It really is fun. And it's the kind of experience that most people don't get to have. So here's a wave of gratitude for all of those beautiful adventures I've had in my life. And I'm grateful I get to share them with you. So here's to waves of hope, of brighter tomorrows, of joyful adventures, and to a year's supply of artificial sweetener. (laughs) Okay, well, maybe not that one, but you know, it still was cool. And so my beautiful friends, I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you blessings. I wish you goodness. And I send you love. We'll talk again soon. Thank you so much for letting me spend this time with you. Good night.